The disciples were in the room with Jesus, and one immediately read discouragement and confusion on their faces. The reason for this was not far-fetched. Jesus told them that one of them was going to betray him. We can only imagine how shocked that news made them feel, and how they exchanged surprising looks, wondering why. Jesus didn't waste time. He mentioned names. He told them that Peter, the same Peter, the one who loved him so much, would deny him, not just once, but three times. And that made the atmosphere even more tense. How was that even possible? Because for the fellow disciples, Peter, along with James and John, came across as the confidants of Jesus, his smaller circle. Matthew 17 When Jesus went to pray, he took these three instead of all of them, and they were the three that experienced the amazing event of the Transfiguration. After telling the disciples this news, he finally broke the news of his departure to them. His time was drawing nigh. For the disciples, this period of time wasn't a good time, bad news. However, the wonderful thing about Jesus is that he is a God that restores and a God of comfort. After giving them this news, he told them he wouldn't leave them comfortless. He was going to send the Holy Spirit. John 14, verses 16 to 18. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. We spoke a little while ago about the things that happen to you when the Holy Spirit comes into your life. However, for a Christian, it does not end there. Once the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you, He just doesn't stay unnoticed. He changes you from within. A change must take place. What it simply means is that the Spirit of the living God is now in you. Galatians 2 verse 20 tells us more about the transformed life and our transition into Christ's life at confession. Galatians 2 verse 20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. I love the clear-cut narrative the New Living Translation gives to the passage. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If you have given your life to Christ and there is no transformational change in your life, whether subtle or evident, it is high time you questioned who is living in you. Today, we are going to consider some of the habits that demonstrate the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the fact that you have Christ in you. Let us look at Psalm 15 and see what God says about a righteous and upright man. Psalm 15 verse 2 He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. The truth about God is that he is a holy God whose eyes cannot behold iniquity. He desires us to work upright with him. If we want to walk with him, we have to align ourselves with him by being holy. He demands holiness from us. Matthew 5, verse 48 Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. A person with the Holy Spirit begins the process of walking uprightly with God. Now I am not saying the moment you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit 
you have arrived and everything becomes perfect. It's not a journey that one sets out on to attain perfection immediately. It's a continuous journey towards perfection and holiness. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the Word of God admonished believers to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. It is a process that you begin to walk towards perfection. There is a clear progression. What does it mean to be upright? Being upright is thinking right, walking right, talking right, doing the right things, and walking blamelessly before God with a pure heart. That is one of the habits of a person with the Holy Spirit. His soul constantly yearns to do the Father's will and do that which pleases Him. There are no perfections in these areas, but progress and effort are needed to pull through. Telling the truth. The latter part of the verse, Psalm 15 verse 2, thinks the truth in his heart. Have you ever told a lie before that you were haunted by the truth and became restless? You became restless. You had to tell the truth before you had peace. If you have ever had that tingling sensation of mild discomfort, it's the Holy Spirit nudging you forward. The Blessed Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Truth, according to John 16 verse 13. And a person who has the Holy Spirit will exhibit truth, which is one major characteristic of the Holy Spirit. If you see someone who has become a perpetual liar and claims he has the Holy Spirit, then the person is deceiving himself. The Holy Spirit and lies are akin to light and darkness. Nobody begs darkness to leave at the sight of light. Immediately there is light it evaporates. The Spirit of God teaches us the truth of the Scriptures and makes us hold on to that which is the revelational knowledge, the will of the Father. Even if you are in a position where telling a lie is the best thing to do for you to get out of an awkward situation, you still won't do it, not necessarily because of you, but because of the Spirit of Truth that abides in you. Those in whom the Spirit dwells will live a life of integrity, honesty, and uprightness. They will seek to tell the truth in whatever situation they are in. Now let us look at the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5 verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, the fruit of the Spirit is the evidence that someone has the Holy Spirit. But today we are going to focus on faith. A habit of someone who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit is that they live their life by faith. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 24 Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. A person who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit stands by faith. When the winds begin to blow and the storms of life begin to rage, they stand by faith and not by sight. But not only do they stand by faith, the Bible tells us they walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 For we walk by faith, not by sight. You cannot get away from this reality. A person who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit is activated to live a life of faith. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13 We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak. The word spirit here in this verse is written with a low case s. In other words, what Paul is saying here is we having the same viewpoint of faith, the same outlook of faith. Paul is saying that irrespective of all the things I have been through, God deposited within me a spirit of faith, an outlook and an attitude of faith. 
Hell threw everything it had, including the kitchen sink at me. But because of the spirit of faith, I didn't give up, and I kept going on. I personally believe that although in this verse it is a low case s, denoting and indicating the human spirit, we could translate this with a capital S, which would make it the Holy Spirit. Jemison Fosse Brown Bible Commentary states the following regarding verse 13. The Holy Spirit is acting and working on our spirits to give us an attitude of faith and a spirit of faith so that we can live a victorious life and not a defeated one. Faith is the foundation of all believers. Faith is the conduit by which we are saved. Faith is the avenue by which we actually receive the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that it is by faith that you please God according to Hebrews 11 verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. A habit of someone who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit is that they live their life by faith. So can we grow our faith so that we can live a life of faith? Yes, we can. How? Romans 10 verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You see, the word of God is made alive by the Holy Spirit. And when you begin to read the word of God, your faith begins to grow, and the confidence that the Holy Spirit gives you is not that that can only be used in church, but you will have faith that you can apply in the real world. The Holy Spirit gives us the attitude of faith. The Bible was written by people who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Every single one of the scriptures we see in the Holy Bible are from the Holy Spirit. Within the Bible we are told how we as children of God should live our lives. God has our best interest at his heart. He is only interested in your well-being and your eternal spirit. That is why the Bible does not sugarcoat or dance around particular subjects. Within the Bible we are instructed on how we are to conduct ourselves as believers and how we should live our lives. This is why we should constantly read the Word of God and have knowledge of it, so that the Word of God along with the Holy Spirit can guide us through this life and into eternity. Let us begin. Have you ever felt like saying something really harsh? I mean, something really hurtful to someone in retaliation to what they said to you? But then, just when you feel that anger welling up in you and about to rush over and spill it out in a form of meanness and vileness, something touches your soul and you pause to reconsider? We all have those moments when we want to defend ourselves with our strength because we feel cheated or short-changed. But the Holy Spirit nudges us otherwise and tells us to hold ourselves back. In James' epistle, the Bible charges and shows us the perfect template for responding to issues and handling matters that might arise in our daily lives. The Holy Spirit is constantly guiding us on the will of the Father and how to best model our lives. There are always subtle warnings and signs He impresses on our spirits on how to effectively walk our journey of faith. Here are four of them. Warning number one. Watch your speech. The mouth, though the smallest part of the body, is very powerful. The things we say with our mouth can either make or break us. They can either bless us or curse us. As believers, we are urged to bridle our tongue and be careful of the words that proceed out of our mouths. 
they carry power. The Bible makes us understand that there is power of life and death in the tongue. We should always make positive confessions and not bring doom or setbacks into our lives because of our utterances. I hear a lot of children of God saying, that scared me to death. It's not a laughing matter, don't say that. Or when a loved one says they are not feeling well and you reply, oh you poor thing, why do you describe your loved one as something you wouldn't want them to be? I know all of these things appear small, but the Bible tells us clearly our enemy, the devil, goes to and fro on the earth and walks up and down on it, looking for an opportunity to enter people's lives. Our enemy, the devil, does not fight far and will even use something as small as that to enter our lives. We should be mindful of the things we say to people and the consequences of what we say to ourselves and about ourselves. Our words should always be befitting of a believer and a follower of Christ. Colossians 4 verse 6 puts it aptly. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how to answer every man. Also, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason, so that we can listen more and say less. We aren't supposed to react to everything insolence tossed at us or be too excited to respond to a situation that we say inappropriate things. We should always take that one minute pause and listen to the guide of the Holy Spirit. James 1 verse 19 advises us to be slow to speak and slow to wrath. The first reaction isn't always the best reaction. And the truth is one sentence has the ability to damage 20 years of a relationship. James 1 verse 19 Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Warning number two, anger. Whenever we are aroused to get angry and spit words that we would likely regret later, we should take a clue from Jesus on what he said about forgiveness. Seventy times, seven times in a day. This isn't literally talking about forgiving someone seventy times, seven times. But how idle could you be to keep a record of how many times someone gets on your nerve in a day? How annoying could they really get? They will definitely be offenses. People will always get on our nerves, that is inevitable. We can't decide or control that, but we can control how we would respond to these offenses. Anger is not a fruit of the Spirit and, of course, shouldn't be a trait that abounds in the heart of a child of God. Ephesians gives us almost a chance to express our anger, but we should also let it vanish almost immediately. Ephesians 4 verse 26 and 27 Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. We are human. And anger is a human emotion, but don't sin in your anger. This simply means that every time we let anger thrive and linger in our hearts, we give the devil a loophole to penetrate and have a soft landing in our hearts. 
Don't ever make decisions in your anger. One decision made in anger can change the trajectory of your whole life. Warning 3. Doubts. A doubtful person isn't just wasting his or her time in God's presence. Such fellow will receive nothing in the presence of God. When we ask, we must connect our faith with our requests and believe that God is going to answer. Once we flinch and start doubting, it means we are placing a limit on what God can do. That way we won't receive anything from our Father. The book of James chapter 1 verse 6 likens a double-minded person to a wave of the sea driven by the wind. James 1 verse 6 and 7 But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. The final warning we are going to look at given by the Holy Spirit in the Bible is pride. James 4 verse 6 But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Every sin started from this point. Before humanity was created, this one sin created war in heaven. There is a popular saying that pride goes before a fall. Even when a prideful person is approaching a pit and is on the brink of sinking deep, nobody would tell him, because he wouldn't just listen. He would rather do what pleases him. God resists the proud and uplifts the humble. This resistance could be akin to the deposal of the devil and relegating him forever to condemnation. We should subject ourselves to God's will and forsake every haughtiness of heart that makes us always beam the searchlight on ourselves and not God. Pride is a sin because it makes us have a self-centered perspective rather than solely focusing on God. I honestly believe this is one of the greatest warnings in the Bible, arguably the greatest warning. What James 4 verse 6 tells us is there is something about the nature of pride that makes God directly oppose it. What a life! Imagine a life of having God against you. We should strive to humble so that we may have grace from the Lord God Almighty. Conclusion We are not perfect or complete in ourselves. So we should continually subject ourselves to the teachings and guidance of the Holy Spirit. We should let Him walk through us and work in us to break down every stronghold of our natural man and flesh by heeding to His constant warnings and signals. People claim to hear the voice of God. However, the truth is that not everyone hears the voice of God. And the Bible is very clear about this. John 10 verse 27 My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. What a verse, what a verse, and what an expression. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. My children hear my voice. When you are born again, you initially don't know the voice of the Lord. Hosea 6.3 actually says, Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. 
when you are born again, you don't know the Lord's voice. But over time, as you begin to develop a relationship with him, you follow on to know the Lord's voice. You will learn to know the Lord's voice. Look at the life of Samuel. Samuel was just a young boy who ministered before the Lord, but he had not yet known the Lord. At that time, God came to him and he did not know how to discern the voice of the Lord because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Verses 3 to 5, the Bible says, And the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli, and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went to lie down. It is amazing that Samuel assumed it was Eli communicating with him. Each time God called for three times, Samuel would run to Eli. It was the third time Eli knew by experience that it was the Lord that had called Samuel. Now I want to ask you a question. Has God spoke to you in your life? And just like Samuel, you did not know it was him speaking to you. There is an old saying that says, I will always follow my first thoughts. I will always follow my first instincts. This is incorrect if you're a child of God. Why, you may ask? Because God doesn't always speak first. You need to know the voice of the Lord in your life. The truth is, that sometimes the devil speaks first. That is why you are supposed to be able to differentiate and to know the voice of God. Look at Elijah. When he was on the run and wanted to hear from God, 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 11 and 12 says, Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. God came to Elijah in a gentle whisper. This is a great lesson to people who believe loud, boisterous worship and preaching is a mark of the power of God and that quietness is a sign of the lack of the Spirit of God. On some occasions, God revealed himself in mighty thunderings as we see in the book of Exodus, but God can also reveal himself in a still, small voice just like he did in Elijah. All of these great powerful things in nature happened. The thunder roared, the lightning flashed, earthquake and fire, but God wasn't in any of them. But Elijah was a sheep who knew the Lord's voice and waited for a still small voice. God doesn't need to shout and to scream and to compete with all the voices in your life that are telling you to do this, telling you to do that. God can be the last person to speak in your life and he can even be the quietest voice in your life. But our Lord Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and a stranger they will not follow but flee from him for they know not the voice of strangers. God does not compete for your attention. He remains God whether you listen to him or not. Even if your life doesn't revolve around him, that does not negate the fact, that does not negate the reality that the whole universe revolves around him. Yes, the devil speaks. We see this in the life of Ananias and Sapphira and even in the life of Judas. 
But that doesn't mean when the devil tries to speak to you, God jumps off his throne and says, Oh, I need to hurry. The devil is trying to speak to one of my children. Let me tell him or her what to do. God doesn't need to panic and God doesn't need to do this because his sheep know his voice. If you are prayerful, if you study your Bible, if you give yourself to prayer and fasting, if you meditate on his word, if you give yourself to searching the scripture, you too can know his voice. God does not need to contest and to compete for your attention because his sheep know his voice. And there is something unique about God's voice that when he speaks, you will know his voice. God speaks in diverse manners to his children. He does not want us to be alienated from him. God has never ceased speaking, but most times we are dull of hearing. We will continue to hear God's voice as long as our spirits are alive to hear from him, depending on the level of our receptivity to the Holy Spirit and the medium through which God chooses to communicate a particular message. He speaks to us in different ways. Through his written word, the Bible, nature, revelations, prophecy, and sometimes through an audible voice. However, hearing from God is not an automatic phenomenon. It requires our sacrifices. If you'd like to hear from God this year, you must take some basic steps. Taking these steps will make you more alert in the spirit realm and help enhance your spiritual sense to hear, see, and perceive spiritual matters. More so, following these steps will help you distinguish between the devil's voice, the voice of your human spirit, and that of God. Firstly, walk in the spirit, not the flesh. Galatians 5, verse 16 to 17. This I say then, Walk in the Spirit, shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. God is a Spirit. Only those who walk by the Spirit can communicate and interact with Him. The Bible even tells us in John 4 verse 24, God is Spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Walking in the flesh typifies carnality. This implies being ruled by your flesh and senses. People who walk in the flesh follow their dictates of what they can see. The Bible refers to them as natural because the things of the spirit are foolishness to them. This is why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. But you can never walk with God by allowing your physical senses to rule you. Apostle Paul gave us a hint on how to overcome our flesh when he said we should walk in the Spirit. You can't walk in the Spirit and walk in the flesh at the same time. This is because the two are by default contrary to each other. When you walk in the spirit, your flesh is overruled and vice versa. Walking in the spirit implies that you become more conscious of spiritual things and act by them at the expense of mundane and sensual things. For instance, when you decide to fast, your flesh gives you a sensation that you will go hungry and eventually lose shape and weight. However, following the imprint of the spirit to fast will make you overcome the flesh and eventually become influenced by the spirit of God. Apart from the issue of fasting, there are other matters which the spirit of God will guide you about. You must learn to follow his instructions. The Bible says in John 6 verse 63, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing, the words that I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life. In this passage, Jesus said our flesh does not profit anything when it comes to spiritual matters. Therefore, walking in the spirit quickens us to hear from God. Jesus added that the word that he speaks is spirit and life. So it will only take a man who works by the spirit to understand God's communication. God still speaks by, is your spirit man sensitive to him? 
The second step is to expect to hear from God. Live in faith that God will speak to you. When you expect to hear from God, your faith towards him will build up and your sensitivity to him will be heightened. The reason many of us have not been hearing from God is that most times we are too busy with our schedules and our hearts are overly loaded with the activities of each day, so much that we forget about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Expectation births sensitivity. When you order something you really want from the internet and they tell you that it will be delivered next Wednesday. When next Wednesday arrives, you live with an attitude of expectation. You become sensitive to every sound of movement you hear in your compound, thinking it is the delivery man. That's exactly what happens when you expect to hear from God. Every spiritual sound will become amplified to your hearing, and as such, God will never deny you access to hear him. However, there is a note of warning. Don't be too obsessed about hearing God's voice, and don't expect God to speak to you in a pattern you have predetermined. God's ways are different from ours. When you are too obsessed about hearing from God, a demon may try to take advantage of you. The point is, just be sensitive to the indwelling Spirit of God and expect God to communicate to you through whatever medium He chooses. Live in the faith that God will speak to you and He will surely do. Faith is so important in the life of a believer. All of God's dealing with us is based on our faith. Matthew 9 verse 29 According to your faith, let it be done to you. Faith opens the door for the divine. Its leg closes the door. If you want God to speak to you, believe that he will. He is a good God that speaks with his children. Only believe. Thirdly and finally, spend time with God. Meditate, fast and pray. Jeremiah 33 verse 3 Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. When you spend a period of time with your earthly parents, you are sure a conversation will ensue, right? That's just the way it goes when you spend time with God, your heavenly Father. You spend time with God by studying and meditating on his word, through singing and worshipping, and by fasting and praying. When you read the words of God, God speaks directly to you. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 to 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. When you study and meditate on God's word, you are reproved corrected and instructed by God. Now I want to ask you a question. What do you think of when I say prayer? Automatically, when we think about prayer, listening isn't generally the first thing that comes to mind. But in reality, prayer is communion with God, and that requires that we listen to what's on God's mind, as well as us expressing what's on our own. Prayer is dialogue between humanity and divinity. There are two lines of communication. When you add fasting to your prayers, it produces a more excellent result by making you sensitive to God's voice. God is waiting for you to call so that he can answer. God is never tired of speaking to us if we are not tired to call on him. Following the steps discussed will put you on the path of hearing from God this year. However, you need to be consistent. The Nine Habits of a Person with the Holy Spirit Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 to 23 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Our habits determine the kind of reward we get in life. There is no way one will not reap what they sow in this life. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 Be not deceived. God 
is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. What habit are we displaying? What are the things we are showing to people? If people see us, can they call us Christians? What are the things influencing our habits? The people in Antioch called the believers Christians because they saw their habits. Their habits were similar to that of Christ. They were able to exhibit the habits of Christ because the Holy Spirit was upon them and He produced good fruits in them. The fruits of the Holy Spirit are not just what we display because we are Christians. They are not natural. They are backed by the power of God. Jesus looked at his followers and saw that there is a need for a change in their habit. Peter denied Jesus due to fear. He lied. Peter also had an anger issue that he cut off the ear of a guard during the arrest of Jesus. So to become what God wants them to be, they needed a change of habit. The habits that God wants you and me to have come from the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witness unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The Holy Spirit is the factor that can change our habits to a powerful and extraordinary one. There are nine fruits of the Spirit. Each of these fruits must be seen in every believer. Are you manifesting the fruits of the Spirit? Are these fruits of the Spirit your habits? What are the habits of the person who has the Holy Spirit? Number one, love. When you see people with the Holy Spirit, you will see that they show love to everyone. When we hear about love, the first thing that comes to our mind is relationships or romance. We have mixed love with lust. We now see lust as love which is wrong. Love is a powerful fruit of the Spirit that we must carry in us all the time. Have you wondered why love came first of the fruit of the Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. He carries His identity. The nature of God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. The more we study to know what God is, the more we know that God is love. Everything about God is love. When Jesus gave two commandments, He made sure love was part of the commandments. Mark chapter 12, verse 31 When Jesus was killed, out of love, Jesus asked God to forgive his killers. We shouldn't show love only when things are going fine or when people love us. This, a habit that Jesus wants us to build in ourselves by the power of the Holy Spirit. When people hate us, we should love them. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. We should never stop loving. This is who we are. This is what Christ has called to show the world. Let your life manifest this fruit. Let it become part of you. Make it a habit. Let people know your habit is not just the natural one, but backed by the power of God. Number two, joy. One of the things people believe about joy is that it is represented by the smile on the face or by the laughter from people. Joy is far more than the facial expressions. True joy is not determined by the circumstances of life. The source of a true joy is greater than the comedy we listen to, the gift we receive from people or the jobs we get. A man got fired from his job after having a meeting with his manager where he received the bad news. His colleagues were waiting for him to break down and start crying so they can console him. This man had no other jobs or other things he could source money from, but to the surprise of his colleagues, he smiled and looked happier. They were confused. They asked him why he was laughing because it wasn't funny, he answered. I have a living God. It might seem that this man has lost his job, but he has not lost the source of his joy. God is our source of joy through Christ. The joy of the Lord gives strength 
that we need to carry on in this crooked world. The joy of the Lord is what we need to keep smiling and stay happy in this tragic world. This joy comes from within. It is not determined by the situations of life. This is why we need the Holy Spirit. Even in a year like this, with all the challenges that we are all facing, the joy given by the Spirit must overflow in your life. The Bible told us to rejoice always. Under no circumstances should we stop rejoicing because our joy comes from the Lord. You will see people who are filled with the Holy Spirit being joyful at all times. It has become their habit. Number 3. Peace Peace, being a fruit of the Holy Spirit, is in two ways. The first is you have peace and the second is making peace with everyone or living in peace with everyone. Peace is something that God has always been giving to His people. Exodus chapter 14 verse 14, King James Version says, The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. This means that God will not allow anything that will cause you trouble to come near you. There will be peace in you. Your body, spirit, and soul will feel the peace of the Lord. The peace that the Lord gives is not an ordinary peace. It is not the one that comes in the absence of conflict. It is a peace that comes with the presence of God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This peace carries power. It is not the kind of peace that is limited to you. It is extended to the people around you. This is where the second part of peace comes in. When you have this peace in you, it starts oozing from your life and the people around can feel it. It becomes your habit. You start making peace with people. You start living in love and harmony with people. This is the time to look at your life. Can people see you and feel the peace of God in you? Is peace part of your habit? Have you allowed the fruit of peace to grow in you? Peace is of God and it is the nature of Christ, a habit that you should always want to exhibit. Number 4. Long-suffering Sometimes you hear people talk about Christians being patient at everything, where they ought to give up, they continue enduring. These people do not know that the ability is from the Holy Spirit. Long-suffering, otherwise known as forbearance or endurance, is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit that helps to grow the habit of patience. Having patience is not what is common in our society today. People are easily frustrated. The inability to exercise patience or forbear things have sent some into depression. We as Christians are faced with many unbearable things. We are judged by others. We are rejected in some cases, but the Spirit of the Lord keeps bearing that fruit of long-suffering in us so that we can stand strong in the Lord. Romans chapter 5, verse 4 says, And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. When we are faced with persecutions and we endure it because our character or habit when people see this, they know it is the power of God that is working in us. It is not easy to endure in the times we find ourselves in this world, but the Spirit of God has the power to make it possible for us. Number 5. Kindness Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. To be kind is not only about giving money to people or supplying the needs of the needy. Kindness encompasses forgiveness, praying for one another, and also showing love to everyone. The display of kindness is majorly through love. When love exists in one's life, it makes it possible for one to be kind. This, what you see in the lives of people who have the Holy Spirit, it is easy for them to be kind not because they were born with it, but because the Holy Spirit made it their habit. Are you kind to the people around you? Do you forgive those that have done bad to you? Are you like Jesus who told God to forgive his killers? Are you ready to pray for those who hate you? It sounds abnormal to be kind to those who hate you, 
but that's what the power of God can cause you to do. You have to embrace this fruit of the Spirit and it will become your habit. It will not leave you. Let the people see Christ in you. Number 6. Goodness Christians with the Holy Spirit are good people. The fruit of goodness is the fruit of the Spirit that gives the ability to do what is right. To be a good person is not limited to helping people. That is kindness. To be good means to accept what is right, to love justice, to not show favoritism, and to obey the laws of God. As a Christian who has the Spirit of God, doing the right thing comes part of them. Micah chapter 6, verse 8 He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to justly to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? God has shown us the path of goodness through the Holy Spirit. What are the good things that we should do? In other words, what are the right things we should do? The Bible says we should do justly, we should love mercy, and we should have humility. We must make this a habit. Doing good must be part of us. Number 7. Faith Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the bedrock of Christianity. It is the first of the identities of the Christians. Christians are mostly recognized by the exhibition of faith. Faith gives birth to power. Without faith, no one can become a Christ follower. Accepting Christ requires faith, believing that Christ died for our sin and believing in that kingdom of God in our heart. It is the work of faith. To have the Holy Spirit, faith is needed. To do what the Lord commands, faith is needed. This is why the Bible established the fact that without faith no one can please God because you must believe that He exists and He is powerful. Believing that God exists gives you the mind to obey His words. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 When you declare things by faith, people see it as something ordinary. They don't know what it is backed with the power of God. Faith is a habit that must grow in your life. We need faith to move mountains that block our progress. There are mountains raised against us. We must make faith to become part of us and use it to move mountains. Matthew chapter 17 verse 20. Number 8. Gentleness. In this violent world, it's quite difficult to find truly gentle people. Some people are gentle because they have not been faced with anger-provoking issues. Some people are gentle because of fear. They are afraid of facing people that will torment them. Many people are gentle at a particular time for different reasons. Jesus Christ told us, What will become of those that are meek or gentle? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, King James Version, he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Those that are gentle and made it a habit are the ones that will not be part of conflicts. They are the ones that will not allow anger to destroy them. Christians are not gentle because they are not faced with fights or because they are afraid, but Christians are gentle because the Spirit of God is solidly behind them. Are you part of these Christians? The people that live close to you, your neighbors, can they testify that you are gentle? What is your life preaching to them? Are you always in a fight with people? The Holy Spirit is not in support of this. The Holy Spirit wants this fruit of gentleness to grow in you and then become a habit that people will see and choose to be like you. You need to go through your life and make decisions to allow the Holy Spirit to make present the fruit of gentleness. Number 9. Temperance Temperance, otherwise known as self-control, is the act of restraining oneself from tempting things or sinful things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 4 That each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Christians are seen to be people who know how to run from sin or to avoid falling into temptation, and they call them holy. The Holy Spirit made it their habit. It is no doubt 
that there are things that are tempting around us. We feel like partaking in all of these things, but we can control ourselves and abstain from each of these things. People see this and think it's ordinary. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us working. It is not physical because the flesh cannot handle self-control. It is the power of God in us that leads us. If we look at all these fruits of the Holy Spirit, we will see that they are interdependent. The fruits of the Spirit are not what will just show up in our lives overnight. We must understand that they are attributes of those who live by the Spirit of the Lord. When you walk in the Spirit and grow in Spirit, these fruits start showing. From one, another, one will show until there are nine fruits of the Spirit in you. If you have love in you, you will keep the peace. You will have no reason to fight anyone. With joy in you, you will know how to preserve. All the challenges you face will be nothing to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, King James Version Charity suffereth long, and is kind, charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth, not itself, is not puffed up. Faith helps you to preserve, believing in a greater glory that comes through Christ. We are at a time when people read the lives of Christians. They don't care about the church you go to, the prayer you make. What they are looking at is your habit. If you have a positive character and you affect the lives of people around you positively, they will choose to serve Christ too. Your life, your habit is one of the things that preach to people. All of these habits come only through the Holy Spirit. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10 King James Version That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God.